Hi folks. Just before we begin, I want to play a promo for the true crime podcast, Excuse Me, That's Illegal. It's a light-hearted true crime podcast narrated by Leroy. Oh, hey there. You like true crime stories, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. Who doesn't? But I gotta admit, after a while, all those stories of murder and heartache, well, they tend to go straight to my hips. So that's why I, Leroy Luna, have created a podcast called Excuse Me, That's Illegal, where we'll take a hardcore look at some softcore crimes. No TED Talks on Bundy here. The letters BTK won't be coming from these lips. Unless he had a brother that used to steal library books. Suppose I'd be willing to go balls deep into that one if that were the case. Anyways, you'll hear stories such as the Mad Pooper, a female jogger who wreaked havoc in a Colorado Springs neighborhood, using one family's front yard as her own personal dumping grounds. If this kind of content sounds like it's up your alley, excuse me, that's illegal. It's available right now on all your favorite podcatchers. So come join me. I'll be right here waiting for you. As always, I hope you've been enjoying this season. And if you want to support the podcast, you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash the troubles podcast. There you'll get early access to episodes, ad free episodes, and I'll also be posting a lot of media related to the troubles. I'll also be posting a companion video to each episode I publish. If you'd prefer to make a once-off donation instead, you can do so over at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Troubles Podcast. Another way to help is to leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. It all helps. Now, back to the episode. Just a heads up that this episode contains quite a vivid and violent description of the events that occurred, so it might not be suitable for all listeners. It was 5.30 in the evening, and 16 textile workers were in a minibus on their way home from the factory they worked at. Four workers got out of White Cross, and the bus continued on before being flagged down and stopped by a man in a combat uniform. They asked which of the workers were Catholics, and the one Catholic man made himself known. He was told to get down the road and don't look back. The Catholic man did as he was told but the fate of the remaining 11 Protestants on the bus would not be the same. This is The Troubles Podcast, a podcast which explores the violence and bloodshed that occurred in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain, as multiple sides and organisations waged a conflict over the status of Northern Ireland. It's 1975 in Northern Ireland. On the 10th of February, the British Government and Provisional IRA entered into a tentative truce to allow negotiations to restart. This truce was indeed very tentative, and there were some on both sides that didn't want anything to do with the truce. This also afforded the British Army a chance to bolster and improve their intelligence, and continue to work on their network of double agents within the IRA. During this truce, there was also a large rise in sectarian killings. The Loyalist paramilitaries were afraid that these negotiations would lead to United Ireland, so they wanted to force the IRA to respond, and so began a spate of killings of innocent Catholic civilians. Loyalist paramilitaries killed 120 people in 1975, with most of that figure being civilians. This tactic was quite effective, and many nationalist paramilitary groups, including the original IRA and the INLA, were involved in a number of revenge attacks during this time. In July, the famous Miami show band were attacked by Loyalist paramilitaries, and three of its members were killed. This violence continued in a tit-for-tat style and culminated with the Reavy and O'Dowd killings which took place on January 4th, 1976. These killings were amongst the most notorious of the Troubles. It saw Loyalist paramilitaries burst into the homes of the Reavy and O'Dowd families and kill the young men inside. In the Reavy household, brothers John, Brian and Anthony all eventually died from their injuries that night. Then in the O'Dowd household, gunmen burst into their home and killed Joseph O'Dowd and his two nephews, Barry and Declan. The night of the killing was sort of a final straw for nationalist paramilitaries. They had a plan in place to dramatically retaliate to the next Loyalist attack, and the killings that took place in the Reavy and O'Dowd households was the catalyst for them to put their plan in motion. It was one day after the Reavy and O'Dowd killings, January 5th, 1976. It was 5.30 in the evening and 16 people had finished their day's work at John Compton's cloth factory 
just outside the town of Glenann. The workforce was made up of both Protestant and Catholic workers, and the mood around the factory that day was quite sombre, as the news of the previous night's killing had become known. A red Ford Transit minibus was taking the 16 people home from work. The bus stopped and four Catholics got out at their stop in White Cross, leaving 12 people on the bus, 11 of which were Protestant. It was a cold, wet evening, and the men in the bus were talking sports, about what had happened with the Manchester United football team, who were due to face off against Leeds United. As the bus reached the top of a hill at Kingsmill, it came across a man in combat uniform waving a flashlight, indicating that the bus should stop. Everyone on the bus assumed that it was a British Army checkpoint, which wasn't unusual at the time, especially considered what had happened the night before. As the bus stopped, 11 men with guns emerged from the nearby hedges, with their faces covered. One man spoke with a thick English accent, and he ordered the workers out and to line up facing the bus with their hands on the roof. He then asked the men, Who is the Catholic? Richard Hughes was the only Catholic on the bus and was terrified that this was loyalist gunmen looking to execute him. It has been reported that two workers, brothers Reggie and Walter Chapman, squeezed Richard's hand as they didn't want him to identify himself and potentially get killed. Eventually he was identified and he stood forward. He was then told by one of the men, get down the road and don't look back. It turns out that this was actually a squad of nationalist gunmen and not loyalist gunmen, as Richard thought. With Richard gone, there was a gap in the line of men, so one of the gunmen told them to close up the line. The next thing the gunmen said was, right, which was the signal for the other gunmen to open fire. The gunmen opened fire on the 11 unarmed men, who were all shot from a very close range. The guns used in the attack were Armalites, M1 carbines and an M1 Garand, and in less than a minute, 136 rounds were fired at the men. As the gunmen stopped to reload their weapons, the order was then given to finish them off, and another volley of bullets was fired into the men, who were now slumped over on the ground. One gunman then walked amongst the men and shot each of them in the head to finish them off. Ten men died at the scene. They were John Burns, 46, Robert Chambers, 19, Reginald Chapman, 25, his brother Walter Chapman, 23, Robert Freeburn, 50, Joseph Lemon, 46, John McConville, 20, James Werter, 58, Robert Walker, 46, and Kenneth Wharton, 24. The 11th man, Alan Black, was shot 18 times, with one of the bullets grazing his head, but he miraculously survived, and it's his account that has provided so much insight into what happened that night. Here's a visibly shaken Alan talking on the Irish radio channel RTE Radio 1 in 2018 about the moment they were all shot. Just a warning, this account is quite graphic. The noise of the gunfire was deafening. It's something I'll never, ever forget. And what they'd done, they'd shot us all at waist level, supposed to stop anyone from running away. And that lasted maybe 10 seconds. And the next thing, I was hit multiple times, and so so was everyone else. But... It was absolutely awful because there were screams of pain. There was some of them weren't able to scream and they were moaning, they were groaning. My 19-year-old apprentice, he fell across my legs and it was absolutely horrific. Uh, He was calling, calling for his mummy. Mommy, mommy, mommy. And the next thing, the gunfire stopped and the same guy that had done all the talking said, finish them off. And the shooting became more measured. And Robert was still calling for his mommy. And I seen 
the boots of the gunman and I seen the tips of the rifle and the blue space away. That's something that lived with me till the, till, till the day I die and he was such a lovely lad and called for his mummy and getting his face blown off. It was absolutely horrific. After the shooting, the men walked away and disappeared into the night. A few minutes later, a married couple arrived at the scene and began to kneel down and pray beside the victims. The couple were astonished to find a gravely wounded Alan lying in a ditch, and as soon as the ambulance arrived on the scene, Alan was taken to the Newry Hospital, where a priest came over to him and asked him if he was a Catholic, presumably to give him the last rites, which is a prayer said before someone dies, as Alan's wounds were so severe. This was the second time that night Alan was asked which religion he was. He said that he wasn't a Catholic, but he asked the priest to stay anyway. As they were wheeling me to the theatre, he held my good hand and he was praying. And that's the last thing I remember before the anaesthetic took over. Back at the scene, Richard Hughes, the Catholic worker who was told to run down the street, eventually managed to flag down a passing car which brought him to the Bestbrook RUC station so the alarm could be raised. One of the first RUC officers on the scene was Billy McCaughey. He was an RUC officer who was also a member of the paramilitary UVF, and he had taken part in the Reavy and O'Dowd killings which had occurred the night before. He described what he saw when he came upon the scene. Quote, when we arrived it was utter carnage. Men were lying two or three together. Blood was flowing, mixed with water from the rain. When I got home, I noticed the bottom of my trousers, big, heavy police trousers, were soaked. I squeezed them out on the kitchen floor, and I think there was as much blood as water. I had a lot of bad experiences, but that was the worst, certainly in terms of human suffering. He went on to say that it was this attack which caused him to pass RUC intel onto Loyalist paramilitaries. McCaughey would eventually be arrested four years later in 1980, and go on to serve 16 years for murder, kidnapping and attempted murder. As well as that, Eugene Reavy, whose three brothers had been shot the night before, was also driving to the hospital to collect the bodies of his brothers when he happened upon the scene. The bodies were brought to the mortuary, where Danny Chapman went in to identify the bodies of his two nephews, Reggie and Walter. Speaking to the Irish Times, he said, quote, I cried before I went in. I expected the worst and it was the worst. They pulled down the sheets, and there they were, lying dead like dogs with their teeth showing. It was as awful as that. I saw mine lying dead like dogs. You can print that in your paper. Some of the victims were also so badly mutilated that immediate relatives were prevented from identifying them. So who was responsible for this attack? One day after the attack, an anonymous phone call was placed that said that the killings were committed on behalf of the South Armagh Republican Action Force. They were a group that claimed to have taken part in a number of attacks from 1975 to 1977. Many believe that the South Armagh Republican Action Force was a cover name used by some members of the Provisional IRA and INLA. The phone call said that the killings were a response to the Reavy and O'Dowd killings, and that there would be no more further action if Loyalists stopped their attacks. The caller also said that this group had no affiliation to the Provisional IRA. This was important because the Provisional IRA was on a ceasefire at the time, and if they were engaged in any activity, it could jeopardise the ceasefire. They released their own statement shortly after the attack, saying, quote, The Irish Republican Army has never initiated sectarian killings, and sectarianism of any kind is abhorrent to the Republican movement. If the Loyalist elements responsible for over 300 sectarian assassinations in the past four years stop killing now, then the question of retaliation from whatever source will not arise. The Irish Times said of the attack, quote, The headless coachman is driving Northern Ireland full tilt down the road to hell. Northern Ireland Secretary of State Merlin Rees condemned the racial attacks on the night as straight gangsterism. He said, quote, Retaliation breeds retaliation, 
And unless people down there realise the wicked nonsense of what they are doing to their fellow men, this will go on and on and on. The investigation into the attack was short and did not reveal very much at all. The RUC at the time was very short of manpower as a result of all the other attacks going on at the same time. The investigation was led by Inspector James Mitchell, who described the scene as one of the most gruesome murder scenes of the Troubles. The incident went on to be known as the Kingsmill Massacre because the shooting happened at Kingsmill. And in later years, an inquest into the massacre was held which heard that the police had failed to follow up on a number of leads. At the inquest, Mitchell appeared and went on to say that for an investigation of that magnitude, he would have needed 40 to 50 detectives and ended up with 12 detectives and two sergeants. He also went on to say when questioned that he was prevented from interviewing an IRA member by the RUC special branch, but it's unclear why. One would assume that this would have something to do with a double agent. The inquest also heard that there was a call placed to the RUC on the day of the attack from a woman regarding a group of suspicious-looking men who were congregating behind a shop. She also described a van that was apparently used as a getaway vehicle by the gunmen, but these leads were never followed up on. Colin Wharton, who lost his brother, described these failures as staggering. As well as that, there was also a palm print found on the getaway minibus, which was thought to have belonged to one of the gunmen. A match for the print was found in 2016, 40 years later, and the suspect was arrested but wasn't charged due to insufficient evidence placing the getaway van at the scene of the crime. The response on the nationalist side was split. Some members of the IRA thought that King's Mill was a step too far. Others believed that it helped stop the killing of innocent Catholics. Colin Wharton said of the night, quote, King's Mill did stop Catholics being killed in South Armagh, but that doesn't justify it. The British military intelligence assessed the attacks and came to the conclusion that the attack was carried out by local IRA members who were acting outside of normal command structure. Things took a turn for the bazaar on January 5th, 2018, which was the 42nd anniversary of the killings. Barry McElduff was a Sinn Féin member of Parliament for East Tyrone in Northern Ireland. McElduff had been known to perform comedy sets, and on this day he uploaded a video to Twitter wearing a loaf of bread on his head in a shop and asking the camera person, where's the bread? It seemed like an innocent enough skit. The problem was that the brand of the bread on his head was King's Mill, and for a nationalist MP to make a video like that on the anniversary of the killings of 10 innocent Protestants at King's Mill, made it look like McElduff was poking fun at the victims of the massacre. It was something that was deemed deeply insensitive to victims' families, and was a huge scandal in Northern Ireland at the time. McElduff apologised profusely, and said that he had, quote, not realised or imagined for a second any possible link between the product brand name and the King's Mills anniversary. McElduff resigned his seat on January 15th as a result of the public outcry to the video. The Loyalist reaction to the attacks was quite varied. On the ground, there was no immediate response from Loyalist paramilitary groups. Though in March, a number of Catholic civilians were killed by a UVF car bomb, which then reignited the tit-for-tat cycle of violence. In the past 20 years, more information about the Loyalist response has been revealed. In response to King's Mill, some members of the notorious Loyalist gang, the Glenan Gang, had plotted to kill 30 Catholic schoolchildren and their teacher, in St. Lawrence O'Toole Primary School. Bill McCaughey, who I mentioned earlier, revealed this plot on the TV show Spotlight, Dangerous Liaisons. This attack was called off because UVF leadership deemed the act as morally unacceptable and could lead to an all-out civil war. There has been another theory that the UVF member who proposed these attacks was a double agent working for the British forces, and he suggested this attack as the British military wanted to provoke a civil war. Another notorious gang, who I covered in Season 1, the Shankill Butchers, also planned a reprisal attack. They hatched a plan to kill all of the Catholic workers who would get into a lorry together on their way to work in Corrie's Timberyard in West Belfast, but this plan was abandoned once the workers changed their route. It's also believed that Loyalist paramilitary Billy Wright, who was covered earlier in this season, joined the UVF because of the attack. Here's a quote from Billy. I was 15 when those workmen were pulled out of the bus and shot dead. 
I was a Protestant and I realised that they'd been killed simply because they were Protestants. I left Mount Norris, came back to Porta Down, and immediately joined the youth wing of the UVF. Members of the Reavy family were initially blamed as having something to do with the attacks, and there are accounts that some members of the security forces began a campaign of harassment against Eugene Reavy. Then, in 1999, DUP leader Ian Paisley said in the House of Commons that Reavy was a well-known Republican and that he had set up the Kings Mill massacre. These accusations were completely unfounded, and the chief constable of the RUC, Ronnie Flanagan, said that there was no evidence whatsoever that Reavy was connected to the massacre. In 2007, the historical inquiries team apologised to the Reavy family, who went on to be exonerated of any paramilitary links in 2010. Eugene demanded an apology from Paisley, which never occurred. The historical inquiries team had a report into the massacre in 2011, and concluded that it was conducted by at least some members of the provisional IRA who may have been acting rogue. As a result of this attack, Armagh, which was the county where the massacre took place, was declared a special emergency area by the British Army, and the elite SAS were deployed there, making this their first official deployment into Northern Ireland, though they had unofficially been taking part in operations and maybe even loyalist attacks prior to this point. The sole survivor, Alan Black, believes that at least one of the gunmen who did the shooting that night was an informer for the British state and that a cover-up had taken place. After the attack, life was very difficult for Alan. He had a lot of survivor's guilt and found it very difficult to fit back into normal life. I, my, two, my two lads w- w- went to the local primary school. Karen was too young to go to school at that stage and I would go up to collect the two boys from the school and... I'd be meeting the orphans. I'd be meeting the widows. Mm. And it would... I felt so guilty about being alive. And I'd come down to the house with the kids. Now, my, there's my wife, Margaret. She she would have went for the kids. But I wanted to go for them mm. because I was so thankful still to have them. And I would come back home and I'd go up into the bedroom. I, I always showed the good side out for the kids. But I would get into bed and pull the clothes over my head and it was such a difficult, difficult time for me. In the 2018 interview, Alan announced that this would be the last time that he would be speaking publicly about the massacre. Though, as of writing, he is still taking legal action in the courts to publicly name some of the attackers. Speaking about whether he holds any bitterness against Catholics after the attack, Alan explained very eloquently and I'll leave the last word to him. Thanks, and see you next time. I had so many good Catholic friends, and they rallied round me, they rallied round the families. So how could I be better? It wasn't, a, it wasn't Catholics that killed us. It was the IRA.